All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, thanks, you guys, for being here. Uh, today's actually kind of interesting. We're going to spend some time in V-Ray again. So we've we've kind of been on our on our track here where we spend a couple days in Rhino, then we do V-Ray, then we go back to Rhino, V-Ray, et cetera. So today we're going back into V-Ray. So it'll be a little bit different. But today is actually kind of a fun one because you get to understand how materials are applied to the object and how the scaling of the materials can make an object look realistic or unrealistic, et cetera. So uh, we're gonna work through what's called texture mapping today. So we'll spend a lot of time working in V-Ray and dealing with texture mapping. I'm gonna have you do some examples, um, kind of like we did when we did the last V-Ray where we had some shapes and we apply the textures to them. We'll do that to get started and, and learn about texture mapping. And then you'll actually go back and texture map the objects that we created in the last two and then bring them into a sample scene and do an official rendering of it. So I'll walk you through all of that. But in the meantime, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And then you have to give me a little bit of time to get organized so that I have everything set up so I can see all of you on my other screen here. Let me get the chat window up. Perfect. So you guys should be able to see my screen nicely now. Uh, I've gone ahead and I pulled up exercise 207. Oh, I think I might have said it was 208. Uh, my mistake. It is 207 that we're going to work on today. Uh, and we're going to start with this part one here, where we're creating a basic uh, set of shapes. And we'll work with that basic set of shapes to, to understand how materials are applied to objects. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Rhino. I am working on the school's remote desktop. Uh, you can tell that because I have my keystrokes enabled, so you can see what it is that I'm uh, I'm doing. So this will look the same if you're working on the school's computer remote desktop as well, which I guess for V-Ray is probably important. I'm going to choose a large object inches template. And just to confirm that it did take, I'm going to look down here, and it is saying inches in my um, units right down here at the bottom. We can close all of the V-Ray toolbars except for the V-Ray complete toolbar. And we'll dock that one up here at the top. Next thing I need to do is go to my render menu and then come down to current render and change to V-Ray for Rhino. So we have to enable V-Ray. And now we're, we're getting good. So uh, first thing I need to do is kind of establish that basic scene. So some of this is going to be some review from previous uh, classes. Let's go ahead and double click on the perspective viewport to make it take the full size of my screen here. And in this perspective viewport, I'm going to come over to my layers and I'm going to create a layer for the infinite plane. So we'll double click on layer one here and I'm going to rename it to IP for infinite plane. And I'm going to change the color of the infinite plane to be, let's move this over a little bit. We'll change it to be black. And I'll say, okay, it's not critical, but I just think it's a little bit easier to look at. And I will make that layer active. So we'll make infinite plane active. And then we'll come up to my V-Ray toolbars here. And I'll click on the V-Ray infinite plane button. The alternative to that would be to type viz infinite plane. Or excuse me, it's just V-Ray infinite plane. And that then drops the infinite plane on my object. So there it is. If we want to see it in shaded mode, we can drop into shaded mode and see it. There it is. And we can orbit around and see that I have that infinite plane. Now, I also would like to have a basic directional light. So let's uh, double click on layer two here. Change the name to uh, light. And then I will create a little helper box here. For my light. And I'll choose this, which is our basic directional light tool. I'm going to turn on my endpoint snap, and I'll snap to this end, and I'll snap to the opposite corner. And then I can go ahead and delete this box by pressing the delete key. And now I have my light shining down on the scene. All right. So now I need to create a composition of objects. But before I do, let's go ahead and lock the infinite plane layer. I'll move myself down to layer five as my working layer. And I'll lock the light layer, oops, light layer as well. So now I'm going to go ahead and create some basic objects. So the first one that I ask you to create is kind of a wall. 
So I'm going to create a wall and we'll say that that's maybe uh, at 12 feet comma one foot. And we'll make that eight feet tall. And there it is. Let's select it and then type Z for zoom, S for selected. So I'm recentering my view around that object. That's good. And let's create a few more objects. So we'll create a like a box and let's do it uh, at four feet comma four feet and we'll make it four feet tall. Let's create maybe a sphere. So we'll do a diameter of four feet. So I typed D for diameter. Uh, it's currently halfway down in the infinite plane. Let's go ahead and move that up. So let's move. And then I'm going to choose vertical or type V. And we'll move that up. Go up two feet. Now it's there. Let's see. Let's create a couple other objects for us. Uh, let's do a cylinder. And we'll do a diameter of the cylinder. So I'm typing D, also of four feet. I'm keeping these objects relatively consistent. We'll do four feet high. And then let's go ahead and do a pyramid. And let's change, well, we can do a five-sided pyramid, sure. So let's go maybe three feet there. That's fine. And we'll go up another four feet, something like that. So these shapes, uh, they, don't, they don't matter too much. I could actually create them all on separate layers, uh, which may be beneficial, or I could just select them. I'm going to hold down the Shift key, and then I could hide the objects temporarily. Uh, if I hide the objects, I just type Hide. If I want to show them again, I can just type Show, and then Enter, and they'll come back. So let's go ahead and start to assign some materials. Now, when I work with these materials, I'm going to hide these objects for right now. We'll come back to them. I'm going to work first with just this cube. Let's zoom selected. There it is. When I go to work with my materials, I want to pick a material that is, has a distinct texture to it that I can really see. So of course, these haven't been downloaded yet. So let's go ahead and download those. Should have started with that. So I apologize, we just have to wait for this to download. So Naomi's asking what size is the box? The box is uh, four feet by four feet by four feet. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, and what size is the wall? Uh, 12 feet long, a foot deep, and eight feet tall. Thank you. One foot wide? Yeah, so 12 feet long, one foot deep or wide, and eight feet tall. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so when I assign a material, I want to pick a material right now because this is the point of the exercise that has a distinct repeating pattern to it. So something like bricks is good, uh, wood would be good, just something that repeats. So, uh, you know, concrete, sometimes you can use concrete, but the patterns aren't as, as obvious as something like bricks. So I'm going to use bricks as my example. We use these red bricks here. I'm going to right click on this and say uh, add to scene. And in this scenario, I can actually come over here to my materials and I can apply it directly to layer five because all of my objects are on that layer. So I'll right click and say apply to layer and we'll choose layer five. And we're now on 
assigned to uh, all the objects on this layer. If I want to preview this, I can click the down arrow next to perspective and I can choose the uh, rendered. And I should get a preview like that of what my bricks look like. And so as I'm looking at this, we can see that one, the texture is much too big, but two, it doesn't really look right. It's kind of squished in the front. So what, what our purpose today is to explore the concept of texture mapping. And so texture mapping is available to us when we select a particular object. I'm going to close the asset editor for right now. When we select our object, and then we come over here to our properties, we've got our basic properties, which are the color circle that tells us what layer we're on. The next one over here is what material. So it's currently using the layered material, and it tells us what it is. The next one over is this kind of curling checkerboard pattern. That's what we're caring about today. So that's texture mapping. So I'm going to click on texture mapping. And you'll see, you know what? Let me make this a little bit bigger. There we go. When we look at this texture mapping dialog box here, once we click on it, we have a bunch of presets that are available to us directly below, or actually this first row. And then it gives us a bunch of information. So let's start with looking for a preset that looks most similar to our object itself. So in this scenario, the closest object would be a box. So how about that? We have a box, and our closest object would be a box. So I can click on this Apply Box Mapping. And when I click on that Apply Box Mapping, it's going to come up here and prompt me. So a lot of times, people will just click on it and assume that it, it took. It didn't. We need to look at our command line. It says, first corner of base, or do I just want to pick a bounding box? So in my case, I just want to pick a bounding box. So I'll click on bounding box. Then it asks me for the coordinate system. Do I want world coordinates or the C plane? In this scenario, those are identical. So it doesn't matter which one we pick. We'll stick with world for right now. And do I want the box to be capped? That means, does it have a top on it? Yes, I do want it to be capped. So I'm going to choose yes. And you see that immediately when I look at this, the brick size is changed and they're uniform. So the pattern on all sides are the same. So let's dive into this a little bit more. If I zoom in here, we can see that the texture comes up this side, folds at the top, and then moves along my object along the top. On the side, this texture pattern continues and wraps around the corner and actually would continue all the way around the object on every side. But as we come to the top of the object here, this folds over, but this side gets clipped. And you can actually see that kind of happening. So there's one seam that doesn't quite work. And this is true for the reality of materials. We'd always end up with something at the top where these didn't quite line up. So we can have one side that folds over, but we can't have both sides like that. So let's look also at our overall size. So when I chose that box map, when I chose that box map, uh, over here in my XYZ size, you can see that it's setting it up to be 48 by 48 by 48. OK, so with that 48 by 48 by 48, that happens to be in inches, which are my default unit. That happens to be the length and width and height of all sides. Hold on one second. OK, so I have those set at 48 by 48 by 48. I can change these values if I want to. And we'll get into changing that a little bit later. But for right now, we'll stick with it at 48 by 48 by 48. What if I want to change the overall height of a brick or the repeat pattern for the brick? OK, if I want to change that, I'm going to come over here to this UVW repeat. And that's how many times is the image repeating on itself. OK, so if I change this UVW repeat, I'm going to lock it so that they all change the same. So I'll check that check mark. And I'll change the UVW repeat to 2. Now, when I change the UVW repeat to 2, you can see that I've doubled the number of bricks in this object. So I can change it to any value in between. I could change it to 
and I get one and a half times the number of brick. So if I knew the actual size of a brick and how many courses I wanted in my four feet, so let's say I wanted uh, four inches to the course, that would be three in every uh, foot, uh, three times four courses would be 12. So I'd end up needing 12 bricks repeating over the course of this object. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that's a few too many repeats. So let's go down to maybe 1.2. And that's probably pretty close. One, two, three, four, five, six, 12. There you go. There's my 12. Pretty close to it. So I can actually size these appropriate to a particular dimension should I want to. So let's pause on this object for right now. Let me show all the rest of the objects. Let's take that one and let's hide it. And let's also hide these three. And let's look at my wall. So if we look at the wall now, obviously the texture is not right. If we look at the presets, well, the closest one is still that box. It's not quite the same, but let's stick with the box. So I'm going to apply the box mapping. I'm going to choose a bounding box again. I'm going to choose the world coordinate system. And yes, I'm going to cap it. And so if we look at it now, my object, which is 144 by 12 by 96 in inches, my texture is kind of getting funny. So the, the texture is getting squished on the end. It's getting squished on the top. And it's projected reasonably well on the front. So in this scenario, I actually want the texture to wrap the corner, even though the object is different, as if this were a square object. So I can come over here to my XYZ size. Instead of having 144 by 12 by 96, I can choose this option, which is X equals Y equals Z. And when I do that, it's going to resize this to be the average of the three sizes. So we're, we're now at 84 inches on a side. And that's showing the overall size of the box or the, the texture. And in this scenario, my bricks are wrapping around the corner and my bricks wrap over along the top here. So I would have to come down here to the UVW repeat. I can check the box for lock and then I could increase the number of bricks, for example, to get the scale right. Now, from the square that I just did, I happen to know that the square was 48 on a side. And I knew my UVW repeat was 1.2. So I can actually use those numbers from the square here. So I could say, you know what? Let's make this at 48 by 48 by 48. And let's set my UVW to 1.2, which gives me the same size as my cube. And now it's the texture is applying across this object rather than across the uh, you know being skewed or whatever. And that should be the same as the square. If I went back to show, we'd see, yep, that and that are the same. So there's actually a trick here. And that is that if you have the texture on one object that you like, you can actually copy it to another object. So I could, if this didn't have a texture applied to it, let me delete the mapping. We're back to the original. I can actually use this tool right here to match the mapping. So I select my object, I click on match mapping, and I can match that. And look, all these values copy over. So once you have one object that has good texture mapping, you can copy that to other objects. Now, what happens in this scenario if I didn't like where the seam happened along this edge? Can I adjust that? Absolutely, I can adjust that. And so to adjust that, we need to adjust where the image is applied. And there's two methods for doing this. One method would be to actually adjust the offset here. And you're going to have to give it a, 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 um, a try on which value to change. I'm guessing it's going to be this first one. But let's say I went to 1, you can see that it jumped. If I went to 2, you can see that it's jumping. So look right along this edge when I change it. I'm going to change it to three. And you can see it's moving the texture. I can move the texture backwards and forwards using this value. So if I went to three here, we'd change how it's applied on this edge. So I'm, I'm controlling where the texture is on the object. 
That's one method for controlling where the texture is on an object. There is another method, and that's to show the mapping widget. So up here in our toolbars, I can click on this show mapping widget, and it will show me, and actually because I copied it, it's over here, it'll show me this little box that I can then manipulate. So just for clarity, let me move it over here so you can kind of see it. As I move this object, my texture pattern changes. So I can decide where I want, for example, let's zoom in here. If I want there to be a seam of the brick right on the corner, I can move that until I get a brick seam on the corner, for example. I can also rotate this if I want to. This isn't going to look too, too uh, exciting right now, but let's rotate it on its side. So I'm going to do a rotate 3D. Let me turn on my snapping here. See, I can rotate the bricks so that they're going on the, on the face of an object in a different direction. So we'll come back to that. I'm going to undo that for right now. And I'll, I'll reinforce that. Well, it doesn't want to do it. Let's, uh, let's recopy it. So let me take this. We'll delete the mapping altogether. And then we can recopy it. Let's match it to this one again. Oops. Hold on. Take this match that object and why is it not doing it for me that's really interesting okay we'll just go with it there so let's hide and go to the sphere so let me select these other objects and i'll go ahead and type hide zoom in on the sphere zoom select it so there's the sphere when i go to do texture mapping on this sphere we want to come over here and the box is no longer appropriate but the sphere is. So I can click on apply spherical mapping. It's going to ask me again, same questions. Bounding box is the default. Yep. We'll do world. Yep. And now we've assigned it. It's pretty close to what was there. Notice that the XYZ size is at 48 and the UV repeat is at one. So I can change this value. Let's go to two. And you can see that I got more bricks out of it. Now, in this scenario, you may want to adjust the orientation of these bricks. So once again, I can show that mapping widget. It's going to show up in these yellow dotted lines. And I'm going to do something else. I don't recommend the gumball for much other than texture mapping. So down here at the bottom, I have a button for something called the gumball. And some people love it, and they like to have it up all the time. Uh, for me, I don't have it up unless I really need it. The gumball brings up this little axis, which allows us to move and, and adjust an object uh, kind of on screen. So in this scenario, I can rotate in the, the green axis, the red axis, or the blue axis. So all I have to do is move my mouse over that axis, and then I can actually adjust the rotation in that axis. Likewise, I could come over here to the red axis, and I could adjust the rotation in the red axis. So this is particularly relevant as we're working through this uh, sphere, because you may want to adjust the texture mapping on this particular object. Now, with this material, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, can you repeat this last uh, uh, action uh, you did? Because your screen, we cannot see the bottom on, on the bottom. Can you? Oh, you can't see the bottom of it? No, we can't. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I wonder why. Please, thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, at the bottom, let me let me go back here. OK, so once I click on, let's hold on one second. Let me hide this. We'll start fresh. Thanks for stopping me. OK, so I have my sphere. I select it. Looks like this. I want to show the mapping widget. So it's this button right here to show mapping. And then at the bottom center of your screen is a button for gumball. It's next to smart tracking. If I turn that gumball on, so if I click on it, I get this tool, this red, blue, and green tool. With that tool active, 
for the mapping, I can then use these little drags to adjust the rotation of the object, actually to adjust the rotation of the texture mapping of the object. So the other thing to point out here is that if we were doing bricks on, on a sphere, we're going to get distortion up here at the top. There's, there's no doubt about it because of the type of image that it is. So the bricks are getting squished at the top, and that's just the nature of bricks. Bricks wouldn't really be in a perfect circle like this. But it's important to show you how that would work. So to get rid of that mapping, I'll come back over here and click on the hide mapping widget. And now that goes away. And I have just the sphere left with the texture mapping applied appropriately. So let's go ahead and hide that object. Oops. Let's show all the objects first. Oops. Show everything. And so we've done the sphere, the wall. Oh, the wall's back. Something wasn't displaying correctly. I didn't think it did. There it is. So let's take these. Let's hide those. Let's take this one. Let's hide it. And now we're left with the cylinder. So let's zoom, select it on the cylinder. And so for the cylinder, when we go over here and we look at our texture maps here, we're going to choose the cylindrical mapping, this one. It's going to ask, do we want a bounding box? Yep. World. There we go. Do we want it capped? Yes. And now it's applying the mapping cylindrically. So it's going around this object. So if we take that, we can do the same thing. We still have 48s, but we can change the repeat. So let's increase that repeat to 1.2. And actually, given the size of this texture, we may end up needing to change this a little bit more. Let's go to like 1.7. Let's try 2.5. Yeah, it's, it's actually, you can kind of see this. It's still stretching no matter how I change it. So in this scenario, we may have to unlock and then change some of the other values. So let's change the X and Y to 1.2. And the Z, let's go back to all of them at 1.2. And let's try the X and Y increasing. So uh, let's go 2 and 2. Nope. And this is where sometimes you have to do some experimentation on which values to change. No, it's definitely not that one. There it is. So I needed to increase the, um, the U and the W values and not the center value to get the bricks set right. So it's just one of those things by eye that we kind of need to work through. I'm not overly worried about the top. In reality, when we start to make these kinds of shapes, we're going to put some kind of different material on top, maybe wood or something. If you imagine this like a well, you'd probably just have this on the wall, and then you'd have a different cap or something that would, that would cover the top. Let's go ahead and show them all again. And we've made our way all the way over to this little pyramid at the end. So let's hold down Shift. And we'll hide all of these. And we're down here on the pyramid. So now this one is inherently difficult because it doesn't really follow any of the basic shapes that we have. So in this scenario, if I were to pick, uh, let's say, a box, I could do it. Let's do a bounding box, world, capped, yes. And you know it kind of skewed it. And maybe it's not too bad. There's, there's some issues with how it's been applied. But like I said, this is an inherently difficult object. So that's not terrible. Let's remove that mapping, right? And we could try maybe a cylindrical map. So we could do a bounding box again, world. No, it's not capped. And there it is kind of going around the object. So it's not, it's not awful, but it's also not uh, spectacular. Hold on one second.
OK, sorry about that. So in this scenario, it's, it's pretty good going around. The levels are even, but it gets really distorted at the top. So none of these options is really great. So there is a, a third and final option, uh, and that's over here. We have, we have an option for unwrap. And this is a little bit trickier to do. So if it goes a little bit over your head, it's OK. It's definitely a more advanced scenario here. But under unwrap, when I click on that, it says to select the seams. So I need to make a seam. We'll take this one going down the side, and then we'll cut around the bottom. So I'll pick that. And then we'll move and I'll pick this and we'll move and I'll pick this one and I'll pick this one and I'll come down and pick that one. So I've picked the bottom and then going up one side. I'll go ahead and hit enter. And so now we can see that the texture actually flows across the seam all the way around. And there's only one seam right here where they really don't match up. So if you were setting up your rendering to occur here, looking at the object, that might not be bad. Now, of course, we have to do some edits, right? We might need to, to rotate. We might need to adjust the repeat value. So let's go to maybe 1.5. Oh, hold on. I have to do it for all of them here because I didn't lock them. And there we go. We can kind of increase the texture pattern. So we can work with it. Likewise, we could work with our, our rotations here using our gumball to try to, oops, sorry, I have to show the mapping. I can come over here and I can show the mapping. And we could then kind of tweak the mapping. You can see the shape there. And so all of those are options. Um, it's just a matter of kind of envisioning what the seam should be on this particular object. And that's really, that's the hardest part of one of these mapping, um, you know, custom unwraps is, is thinking about how the object folds together. Obviously, you'd be hiding that scene in the back. Okay, so let me go ahead and type show, and we can see all our objects there. Let's see. So we have our materials applied. We've gone through the various strategies for texture mapping. Uh, we've understood the concept of being able to show the widget and manipulate the widget. Now it's time to go ahead and open up our, our work from last class. So I'll leave this one open. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to open a brand new Rhino or find my file rather than going to file and then open. So let's go into my uh, folder. Let's go. So I want to open up that bridge sample right here. And that's not the same one. Let me hold on. Sorry. Let me get. Did I not save it? Try this one. Yep, all these are right. I got myself into trouble because I didn't save it last time. Let's see, maybe I saved it in here. Oh, I did save it. Never mind. Sorry. Nope, that was a curtain wall. We need to go back to that's where I was off. All right, there's the bridge. Okay, so there's my bridge. Now we set this up and we already uh, put an infinite plane in and a light in. Now, when I go to use this later, I actually don't want any of those objects because we're going to use this as what's called a block reference. So we're going to use this and bring it into another scene. So I'm going to go through, look at my layers. Oops, wrong Rhino. Let's make this one big here so I don't make that mistake again. So look at my layers and I'm actually going to get rid of the infinite plane. So we'll right click and we'll say delete layer. Yep, go ahead and delete it. Um, yes, I want to delete it. There we go. So I'm back to where I have just the bridge. 
I'm also going to take this bridge and I'm going to move it so that I can copy points really easily. So I'll move that point to 0, 0, 0. So it's right down there at the origin. And then I want to make sure that my materials have been applied appropriately to it. So if I switch over here into my rendered view, I believe I already put concrete on it. There it is. But I want to make sure that the texture mapping is correct. So let's go ahead and take my objects. I'm going to select them all at once. I'm going to go over into my properties. I'm going to choose texture mapping. And I will apply a box map to it. We're going to do a bounding box. We're going to do a world. Yes, it's going to be capped. And so now the concrete should be seamless all the way around my particular object. Remember, we could select this concrete and we could adjust the scale of it. So if I came over into my uh, properties here, my UVW repeat, we could up the scale maybe to 1.5. And the texture would get a little bit smaller. So you find one that, that feels appropriate for you. That looks pretty good. So it's been texture mapped. Let's go ahead and save this. I've gotten rid of the infinite plane. The one last thing for organization purposes, I want to get rid of any extra layers. So I'm going to make the bridge layer current, and I'm going to get rid of all the rest of these layers. So I'll select them all. I'm going to right click and say delete layers. And I'm down, left with just the bridge. There it is. We'll save it one more time. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this in as a referenced file. So let me go back to our exercise 207 page. And right here, I have two test files for you. One has a sky, one has an all white background. You can use either one. I'm going to pick the sky background here. And it's going to download. And as soon as that downloads, I'm going to go ahead and open it. All right, and so in this scenario, you can see that I already have an infinite plane and I already have my directional light installed. So I can actually just bring in those other objects. So let's make this one big. Let's dock my V-Ray toolbar here. Let's make sure my current renderer is set to V-Ray, which it is. And I'll go to edit and then blocks and then insert block instance. From this little insert, I want to click on the file, and I want to go find that file that I just saved. So let's go into my live demonstrations. This was in 205. And there's my bridge. I'm going to go ahead and say open. And this is going to ask us some options. So we can directly embed the file, or we can choose to link the file. Long term, when we get to working on the final and whatever, using these linked references are really, really important. So we're going to link the reference. Our layer style, we want to choose reference layer. So it's linked with a reference layer. And we'll say OK. And then we'll say OK one more time. And there's my bridge. So I can actually drop my bridge into the scene. I'm going to turn off that gumball. There it is. And let's move it a little bit higher. So let's go to move. We're going to choose vertical here. And let's go up by maybe five feet. There it is. So it's kind of floating. So if I go in and I render this, so let's click the little teapot to do a sample render. We can see that it's casting a shadow. Right? But my material came through with the object. It's texture mapped the same as my original, and it's come through with my object. Now, one of the powerful things about bringing these block references in is that I can actually take this block reference and copy it multiple times. So let me go to copy, and I could copy it from right there. And now I could stack them together along the way. And I could make a bridge that keeps going. Now, I, I, can, I could keep doing that. 
I could type in, I think this was four feet. So I could type in the values that are at four feet. Or I could just keep zooming and stacking these together to create that little bit of a bridge. Now, obviously there's no supports. And if you wanted to add supports, you could add supports, um, but you're getting the idea uh, based on what I'm doing. Now, the, the powerful thing about this when we're using these block references is that I can, let me save this one for right now. Uh, save that right there, uh, is that I can make changes to the original file. So let me come back here to my bridge. And let's say I wanted to, to change. And you saw this in some of the ones that I opened. I added a little wooden rail that went on top of this. So let's say I wanted to add that wooden rail. I could say, OK, let's do a new wooden rail. And let's say that that's maybe uh, three inches tall. Let me move it up, move vertical two inches and let's move it this way by one inch. All right, so there's that. I would need to apply a new material to this. So let me go into my uh, V-Ray materials and let's look at wood. And sure, let's do this. I'm just going to apply it directly to the selection. There it is. I need to do my texture mapping on it. So the wood's kind of going the wrong direction here. Let's go over to my texture mapping. We'll do a box mapping on it. Um, we got a bounding box world. Yes, we want it capped. I'm going to do the x equals y equals z to try to get the, the grain correct. Now, the grain here is, is going the wrong direction. I want it going the length of this. So we'll show that mapping widget. And I did, sorry, I didn't actually click the button here. Show the mapping widget. There we go. And then I'm going to rotate this. 90 degrees. I'm going to hold down shift. That was there it is at 90. And I now should see the, the wood going along the side there and along the top. So that looks pretty good. So I've created that and we can hide the mapping. I'll come back here to hide the mapping. There it is. Now I need to copy this over to there so I could take this piece. We could mirror it. Snap to the center there. I actually don't have my midpoint snap on. That's why I was having trouble. And there's the other piece. Let's hide the gumball for now. There we go. And once I save this, if I go to File and then Save, I can go back to my bridge and I can go to Edit, Blocks, Block Manager. And see how here on the bridge, it says Linked File is Newer. I can actually choose to update that to the new version. And now the work that I just did is now showing up here. Now it looks like I have some issues. <laughs> These didn't quite line up the way they were supposed to. Uh, actually, I, I think when my copying, I stacked them by accident. But you guys get the idea for what you can, you can actually do as you start to create these model modules. So I've done the texture mapping on this. Let's bring in that glass curtain wall. So let me go into my blocks. So I'll go to edit, blocks, and then block manager. And I'm going to bring in that curtain wall. Oops, sorry. Edit, blocks, insert block instance. Click that little file icon. And this time I'm going to find my glass curtain wall. So there's my curtain wall. We can say open. We're going to use it as linked with a reference. And I'll say OK. We'll say OK. And we can drop it in. Now I've got a problem. When I did that, it brought in another infinite plane in addition to my glass. 
So I need to go back to the original and I need to edit that. So let's go to file and then open. And let's open that original and then we'll update it. So there's my curtain wall. So let's go into my properties. We'll get rid of the infinite plane and the light. So we'll right click and say delete layer. There it is. Uh, looks like our light, we need to delete that. The, the light won't come through anyway, but it's good practice. Uh, we've got our glass and our clamp. Let's delete these two layers. I'm going to rename the default layer here to be uh, curtain wall. And I'm going to make the glass and the clamp sub layers of that curtain wall. So I'll select them and then drag them on top of the curtain wall. And now they're sub layers. Just helps with our organization. Let's go ahead and save this. I'll go to file and then save. We'll jump back over into my bridge scene here. And notice if we look at our layers, we've got our, uh, the bridge is nice and organized, but the curtain wall is kind of messy. So let's clean that one up. So go to edit blocks, block manager, and let's update that. So it needs to be updated. We'll click on update and the infinite plane's gone. So now we can start to use this. I need to rotate it. So this is a regular rotate and we'll rotate by 90 degrees. like that. And then we need to kind of copy and paste a bunch of these. So if I were just copying and pasting these, it would take me a while to make a huge row of these, but I can actually use a command called array. So if I type in array, A-R-R-A-Y, I can choose the number in the X direction. So that's going to be one. The number in the Y direction, I don't know, let's say 20. The number in the Z direction, that's up and down. Let's do maybe seven. And I'll hit enter. Y spacing or first reference point. So if we want to deal with the Y spacing, it would be from that point to that point. Then it's going to ask me for the Z spacing. So it would be from this point there up to that point there. And now you can see I was able to create this wall relatively easy. So it's showing me what it kind of previews and what it looks like. I'll go ahead and hit enter. And that then makes it active. And then let's zoom in here and get a nice little view to render. Maybe about like that or so. And then we can open up my little uh, teapot and perform our first render. And so you can see the glass curtain wall with all the spider clamps, and you can see that bridge there. That's what I'm going to ask you for at the end today. So the part that we did in the beginning with all the texture mapping, that's the learning process. This one is about learning how the texture mapping works and playing around with your various options. The second part where you clean up these, apply the materials. I had already applied the material. There's no texture mapping necessary here because the metal being applied here isn't going to really change nor am I rendering close enough. The glass is uniform for glass. This bridge file did take some work. And you're going to bring those both into a scene. You'll do an array of the glass, and you'll copy and paste or do an array of the uh, bridge so that they all start to come together. You'll perform a rendering. And then this is the piece that I want you to turn in for today's exercise. I just want to make sure that that agrees with what I said here. right? If you end up having extra time, you may want to consider working on your assignment 201. You can now start to do more of the geometry, and um, you can also apply some preliminary texture mapping so you can start to see this stuff come together. Right, Brooke had a good question. I'm looking at my chat. Sorry, it was a few minutes late here. Uh, she said, can you delete the infinite plane after it's been imported? Two important notes. One, we're not importing it we're inserting it. So it's a linked reference file. If we had imported it, then yes, we could delete it. But since it's a linked reference file, it lets us go back and fix the original and then you know, basically update it, that reference. And in that scenario, the only way to delete it 
would be to delete it in the, um, the original file, the reference file. So for example, if I were to click on one of these, they would show up as basically kind of like a group where I can't go in and individually, like I couldn't select this rod and change it in any capacity. I'd have to go back to my original file here to actually change the material or change what it looked like, et cetera. So it's always the original, and then you have your reference where you're doing the rendering. And this is a really good habit to get in. It's early right now, so it doesn't really matter. You could do it all in one scene, but bringing them in as reference files is something we'll do a lot of going forward and, and certainly for your final project because it's the only real way to keep track of all these different files that, that all work together. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. I think we covered it well for today. I'd like you to get started on that. We'll have our first check-in. Uh, it's at 12.10, so you've got about 10 minutes uh, to take a break, and then you guys can come back and I'll come back and we'll go from there. Were there any questions before I let you go? Nope, it doesn't sound like it. All right, I'll see my first check-in group at 1210. The rest of you guys have a great, uh, have a great rest of your day.